So I want to talk a little bit going back in time as well in uh, about the different technologies and what we have done um, over time. And <coughs> just when, if you're talking about the legacy of Dolly, I've <coughs> certainly our program was inspired and initiated really with the breakthrough of Dolly. And I've um, selected this cartoon in a New Zealand paper because it exemplifies really the impact that it had on our program, but also on many different people around the world. So there's a paper in New Zealand, and they have used um, a sheep as an icon, really, to represent our work in New Zealand on cattle. <coughs> <laughs> uh, just briefly, uh, I'm going to talk about a very simple strategy uh, that we used at the beginning to overexpress uh, milk protein genes, and then getting a bit more precise in trying to um, change a specific gene by RNA interference and then going into uh, genome editing, the new technology that's available today. And so <coughs> we started out um, trying to overexpress uh, important milk proteins, the, uh, the caseins. And we <coughs> used two different caseins, beta casein and keba casein. Uh, keba casein is an important one. Um, but it's a minor protein, so we have used the regulatory sequences to express it Oops. Uh, for, uh, for expressing this keba casein from the beta casein, which is a strong, stronger expressed uh, milk protein. And the rationale behind it was to improve uh, the milk composition, but also uh, improve functional properties of this new milk. And uh, this was done by uh, the cloning technologies or by uh, nuclear transfer using a cell, int uh, introducing these uh, gene constructs into these cells and then generating an animal. Um, <coughs> this is now uh, just looking at a comparison between the, the milk produced um, of a wild type animal uh, with comparable genetics except for the trans genes in a transgenic sample. So they are, the milk proteins are labeled with different fluorophore and then you can compare the two. And uh, to make things a little bit easier, we have used um, these milk proteins come naturally in different variants. And so we have used a different natural variants to our genetic background. And um, as you can probably see over here, um, our normal um, background has two dots here for, for beta casein, where we're producing three in our transgenic animals. And uh, if you <coughs> overlay everything, you can see this uh, dot here, this is a, a beta casein variant that's produced by the uh, uh, change gene. Uh, similarly, we use a different one for kappa casein, and shown here, the, the green one is the wild type uh, variant, and we are producing from, the, uh, from our change gene here uh, a different variant in red, and as you can see, um, Kappa casein is a highly glycosylated protein. You see uh, many, many different uh, isoforms, glycos glycosylated isoforms that become more pronounced because we've increased uh, the kappa casein by about threefold. And so, probably forgot to mention, there's a, a 2D separation by size and uh, charge. <coughs> and so, the kappa casein um, is very uh, special in that. Uh, the uh, <coughs> caseins are usually um, organized in a colloidal micelle in the, in the milk, and that allows a high uh, protein contact in the milk being uh, at a low viscosity. And so this kappa casein on the outside in determines the size of these micelles, and it can, as you can imagine, the, these casein micelles also play a critical role in the functional properties and the processing of milk. And it was seen as a, a big advantage, uh, particularly for the G-seal, to have smaller micelles. And it was expected that a high uh, concentration of kappa casein will reduce the uh, micelle size. And this is exactly what we are seeing, that we um, have achieved a, 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 a great reduction in the micelle size in, uh, in the transgenic milk. Now, <coughs> as I mentioned before, kappa casein is also a highly glycosylated protein, and uh, the main uh, content of salic acid, which is an uh, essential nutrient for the developing brain, is, comes from uh, kappa casein modification. And uh, we were interesting to look 
at uh, this high cabocasein milk as well, if that translates into high salic acid content. And that's what we have seen there, that um, the salic acid content is also increased by about two to three fold uh, in this new milk. So it's meaning that uh, we are not have a saturated system, but the memory gland <coughs> is able to fully modify and glycosylate um, the cabocasein, the salic acid, uh, for the extra cabocasein. <coughs> now with that, uh, coming to uh, the next set of, of projects that we tried um, uh, to modify alter a specific gene uh, that has been associated with uh, um, allergenic properties of cow's milk. About 2 to 3 percent of infants are allergic against uh, cow's milk proteins and uh, the protein beta-lactoglobulin uh, has been identified as one of the major allergens in cow's milk. It's not produced in humans or rodents, and so uh, elicits a very strong uh, immune response. And uh, the genetic modification, of course, offers a very direct route um, to maybe reduce or even eliminate um, this particular protein. And so the first approach that we tried was uh, gene targeting. Um, that was the standard approach in the mouse in the ESL technology and we and um, quite a number of other labs miserably failed in, in doing that in our uh, primary cells. So we, we switched to um, RNA interference, which allows <coughs> us to interfere with the specific messenger RNA uh, for that particular gene, and then either destroy or, uh, the messenger, uh, messenger RNA or block the translation from the messenger RNA. And I've listed there another approach that I'm going to talk about. We can now also use uh, designer nucleases to uh, knock out uh, that particular protein. <coughs> and so what we have done, we have um, tested and uh, produced uh, uh, an RNA interference construct based on uh, two small uh, microRNAs that were specific uh, for two different locations on, on the um, messenger RNA for BLG. And it was uh, also driven by uh, a mouse milk protein promoter, so we wanted to produce these uh, interfering RNA molecules at the same time in the same tissue where our target gene uh, is produced. And so we introduced these into cells and then produced an animal from these cells by um, the cloning tech, uh, yeah, by the Dolly technology. And uh, <coughs> when we looked at uh, the milk composition in these, uh, in milks produced, um, from the one animal that we produced, there's another parallel to Dolly, we have only managed to generate one found animal. Um, and we hormonally induced a very young animal into lactation, and that's why we have here a few uh, different controls. So colostrum is the milk produced uh, at day one of lactation, there's lots of uh, maternal antibodies still in there, and also control with induced milk, which you can see the slightly uh, increased uh, BLG levels in there. And so when we looked at uh, the milk samples that we have um, that we got from the one transgenic animal, you can see that uh, the colostrum looks pretty similar with the maternal antibodies produced, the caseins over here, it's all there. Uh, the only thing that's missing is uh, BLG. And so it look, looked like a, a real very efficient uh, BLG knockdown with these um, interfering RNAs. And we <coughs> also did a more sensitive test with the Western uh, blood, and although there we can't see any BLG being produced, so we definitely, the knockdown is under the detection level limit um, with this Western that we can detect. Now, <coughs> as I mentioned, we had one founder animal, and so that was <coughs> our basis of uh, continuing the work, and when we looked a little bit closer, what we found that um, this founder animal has in fact had three insertion sites of the change gene. And that's of course then causing a problem in that these insertion sites will segregate in the next generation. But also highlights one of the problems because this RNA interference approach uh, was based on a random insertion of, our, of a construct. And um, so we have used assisted reproductive technologies to uh, produce more embryos, more offspring, from this single uh, animal. 
And um, what you have seen there, so this is just for comparison, um, the, the situation in the founder where we've seen the uh, three insertion sites. So we have produced also some uh, animals uh, in the next generation that still contained all three insertion sites. But um, as I mentioned, they will segregate. And so we have also produced some animals that uh, have combinations of, of two of these sites in here. AC and BC, or also single insertion sites, plus also some animals that would have not any copy of the trans gene itself. And so <coughs> we're looking at um, the stability in the transmission of the knockdown phenotype in the next generation. We looked also at uh, induced milk samples from the, all these animals. And I first want to um, draw your attention to the, our positive controls here on this side which are the uh, offspring that didn't have receive any of the trans genes in some wild type animals with nicely uh, express uh, BLG. And I also want to emphasize that for our test real test samples, we have used uh, about five times the loading that we have used for uh, uh, the positive controls just to make sure uh, we will see um, any BLG being expressed and up here you can see the offspring with uh, quite a variety of different insertion sites being present, so two, one, or three. And here, as a comparison, are milk samples from the founder animal. And uh, what it shows is that um, the knockdown phenotype is very stable, transmitted into the next generation, and also that we are not necessarily needing all three of the insertion sites to see this robust and very efficient knockdown. Um, and um, certainly two, like here and here, two insertion sites are sufficient in at least for the single insertion site of, of uh, this particular C insertion site is sufficient for a robust and efficient knockdown. <coughs> now coming to the last part, and I, I probably being the first speaker, I give you a little bit of an introduction to genome editing, although I'm pretty sure most of you will be familiar with this new technology. And so uh, these are site-specific nucleases, and the major players are zinc fingers, <coughs> talons, and CRISPR-Cas9 system. And uh, the first two are chimeric proteins fusing a DNA binding um, domain to uh, the FOC1, so restriction enzyme catalytic domain. Um, the zinc fingers using as a the DNA binding motif a zinc finger uh, that recognizes three different uh, three bases, so a triplet, and they can be um, assembled to recognize um, a longer se uh, target sequence. Similar, the talons just using a, a different DNA binding uh, element, recognizing single base bases here, and you, again you can assemble. Um, many of these modules to make uh, more specific DNA binding uh, domains to target sequences. Uh, CRISPR-Cas is slightly uh, different. It uses a uh, universal uh, nuclease, in this case uh, the Cas9 protein. It uh, has two catalytic domains uh, cutting the both strains each um, of the DNA double strand break. And the, the specificity um, of the target specificity is uh, recognized by um, base pairing with the target sequence by um, so-called guide R, a small RNA molecule, the guide RNA. And so it becomes very easy to, to design different uh, of these CRISPRs just by changing the uh, recognition side and the base pairing region uh, of, this little, uh, of this small RNA molecule. And <clears throat> but what they all have in common, what they introduce is a double strand break in the DNA at the target sequence. So at a very unique site in the genome. And this triggers a repair mechanism in the cells, and it's repaired by an error-prone uh, repair mechanism, the non-homologous end joining. And as a result, um, errors are introduced, usually a small insertions or small deletions, also called indels. And that makes it very easy and simple to uh, disrupt uh, gene functions by disrupting the reading frames. But probably more excitingly, it also boosts uh, homologous 
uh, directed repair, homology directed repair uh, mechanisms. And in the, in the presence of a uh, repair template down here, it's possible to introduce now uh, specific mutations uh, to knock in genes and replace genes as well. So these technologies or the nucleases can be introduced again in cells and then using nuclear transfer to generate animals gives you the full control of the uh, animal that you are producing or these uh, nucleases can also be introduced into uh, one cell embryos. Now we have used <coughs> the uh, injection into uh, zygotes and again we have used as our target BLG and uh, using talents uh, for our genome editing in collaboration with Recombinetics. And um, we wanted to uh, introduce a, a specific mutations, a mutation that could possibly mimic a natural mutation. And um, this is our uh, homologous repair template down here and uh, featuring a nine base pair deletion that uh, introduces a premature stop codon within the signal peptide of the secreted milk protein. <clears throat> and when we analyzed um, embryos at the blastocyst stage, so the injection is at the one cell stage and we analyzed at the blastocyst with is around 120 cells, we saw that about, um, about half of the injected embryos um, would have uh, the specific mutation present in the genome. Now we were also interested, of course, of how efficient the modification uh, works and so we have done some deep sequencing to quantify how much of the uh, wild type allele is still present in these embryos. And what we, not uh, completely unexpectedly, we saw quite of a range, but more importantly <coughs> is that we also find about 10% of the uh, injected embryos had almost completely converted uh, to a genotype with only having the uh, edited uh, genotype there. And so with this confirmation, we wanted also to produce some animals, and so we produced again uh, uh, in vitro um, embryos, and they were injected at this uh, zygote stage. And this time, we took biopsies from a blastocyst, and these blastocysts can then uh, be cryopreserved and stored, and the, and the biopsy can be used to analyze for the presence <laughs> of uh, the specific genome edit and then validated embryos can be transferred for uh, generating some animals. And uh, this is a, a picture of two um, genome edited uh, animals that uh, have a knockout of, of BLG. And uh, just show you one slide of data, which I hope will convince you that uh, that is correct. And um, here again is the, the wild type locus. Uh, which also contains uh, a restriction site for SFO1, uh, which is missing in the genome edited allele. So, so we can use amplification of this region and then digest with F SFO1 uh, to uh, find out how much of the uh, genome <coughs> is edited in these animals. And we have used samples from uh, DNA samples from blood, isolated from blood, and also from, from a, a small ear biopsy. And as you can see, these two animals uh, so apparently have no SFO uh, one side anymore, whereas the control animal can be uh, easily uh, digested. And so that will indicate that these two animals are almost completely conver converted to the genome edited uh, genotype. We have also now some uh, next generation sequencing data on this locus that uh, shows that about 99% uh, of uh, this locus is uh, of the uh, genome edited genotype. <coughs> and just to finish off, um, I think as you can see the, the power of this new technology is that uh, gives us now a much more opportunity to go into fine detail in changing a milk composition and uh, uh, addressing some of the, the issues that have been dri driven the uh, dolly at the outset uh, for uh, uh, altering milk in, in livestock species. And with that, I just want to end up with, uh, again, probably um, copying um, uh, 
uh, Ian's comment that, uh, of course, behind there's a huge team of people, and I probably haven't listed all of that, all of the people ha that have been involved over all the time uh, of the project, but uh, clearly the people in the transgenic team, and we had huge help from the uh, embryology team uh, led by David Wells in, in uh, helping with the cloning of these animals and uh, <coughs> of course also a very important uh, the people that are looking after these animals on the farm on a daily basis. Um, finally, I want to also mention again our collaborators on the Talon project, um, Ben Carson and Scott Farringcrook. And with that I um, finish. Thank you, Gertz. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions for Gertz? Thank you for this very nice talk. I had a question uh, regarding um, the efficiencies of uh, gene editing. Do you see a correlation between different loci and variation in efficiencies? Um, in our own experience, we have only um, done genome editing on, on our favorite locus so far, but uh, clearly there will be differences in different loci, but it's often uh, very difficult to uh, compare them directly because everybody's designing uh, different tools for uh, specific sites in different genes that might be not quite as active as, as the other ones, so it's hard to compare, but I certainly would think that there are locus effects. For many years, New Zealand's prided itself on green agriculture. How do the industry and the government regard this research? Um, good questions, and we had our up, ups and downs in uh, working in such a, a controversial area. Um, initially, at the beginning of the program, we had some support from the industry that uh, completely changed with uh, public perception being very negative on gen uh, genetic engineering. I would say we... Um, we are dependent on government funding, so uh, that's certainly a sign that they were still uh, supportive of getting this technology established, and, uh, and that's still the case. And at the moment, they, it looks more promising with a new uh, genome editing technology that the industry sees the potential and gets interested in, in this sort of technology. Paul? So, fo following from... Um, Ian's question and uh, taking up Bruce's invitation to put the speaker on the spot. You've told us about the opportunities. Now, how about some of the challenges? So there's transgene silencing that can affect the uh, efficiency. Is that still an issue in the field or has that been sorted? And more importantly, if you're expressing a protein and there's the potential to perturb protein homeostasis, protein misfolding events, uh, not only damaging your product, but perhaps a source of infectious um, uh, uh, pathogens, how do you feel about all these challenges? Are they real? Are they uh, conflu conflated? <clears throat> of course, um, some of these challenges are, are real. I haven't presented, of course, all the data that we have. Um, we've also generated um, lines that didn't well express the change gene. This comes from this random insertion. But I think the uh, move to uh, more sophisticated technologies like the genome editing will allow you uh, to have better handle on the expression issues. Um, I guess misfolding um, proteins um, can be an issue, but of course it all comes down to characterizing um, again the proteins that are expressed and particularly also the functional properties. With the first project, I think I've also just uh, touched on maybe the, the complexities that can um, probably follow. Milk is a highly complex biological fluid, and so you're changing one thing and that uh, might lead to changes of all sorts of other uh, aspects of the milk as well. <coughs> well different proteins, uh, fats, minerals, and so on, but also the processing pro properties. And um, I guess it's both a challenge and an opportunity uh, to see how that might improve um, possibly <coughs> the nutrition, uh, some nutritional aspects, uh, some tailored nutrition for uh, uh, people uh, requirements, specific uh, requirements for uh, the nutrition of people. Yeah. Thank you. One last question. 
Um, again, a slightly related question is, um, <laughs> is on a regulatory basis there, so, so you've got the potential to produce milk with bioactive molecules in. At, at what point does it stop being a nutritional product and become a pharmaceutical product? And, and what's the scope down the line for widespread uh, tailored milks with different bioactive properties? How's the regulation going to work there? <coughs> I guess it's fair to say that at the moment there is um, nothing regulated uh, of any milk proteins being changed. And, um, but at the moment there's a big discussion how to treat genome editing, for example. So if we take the last example, if we uh, knock out an allergenic, well, re yeah, an allergenic protein, essentially reducing an allergen of the milk protein, how is that viewed uh, is, is a is it a genetic modification or just a natural, or similar to a natural mutation that might be just a, a variation of the uh, a normal uh, milk? But I guess it needs, of course, all a lot of more data accumulation on what sort of changes that uh, triggers in the milk, how that changes the protein composition or the total composition of this particular milk, and plus, of course, also the benefit potential benefit of this milk having not this allergenic protein. That gives me a great entry to say that come back next Tuesday and Wednesday to Roslyn and we'll have that very debate. Um, but uh, that's for next week. This week, thank you, Gertz. Thank you very much. Thank you.